In my time, I've been to quite a few communications industry R&D labs around the world, and most of them are either squirreled away secretly underground or 50 stories up in a skyscraper somewhere, some anonymous building downtown in a big city. But not this one. This is the AT&T foundry in California, close by San Francisco in Silicon Valley, and it's actually in a French laundry, or French laundry as was. So now, let me introduce to you Michael Fairchild, who is the Director of New Technologies and Engineering at the AT&T foundry, Palo Alto, California. You need to be continually trying new things out and moving quickly. So what we do is we try and uh, tightly scope projects and we work often in 12 week sprints. So we'll define a project, put it on a small document, say uh, two pages at the max, and uh, then get a small team together and get going. And so we'll try and rapidly come up with a couple of prototypes or something we can get in front of people. Sometimes it's an internal business customer that we want to make sure we've got the idea right. Sometimes it's a product or an experience we're trying to create for a customer, and we'll try and create something and get that out in, you know, in the market or a small trial or an alpha deployment. The Foundry is a fully resourced $70 million investment with some 20 projects passing through it at any given time. The emphasis is on brevity and speed. A lot of our ideas come from fast pitches, so uh, we'll have a challenge we'll put out, like uh, perhaps we're looking for ways to improve video security in our digital life offering, and therefore we'll put out a request, a challenge, that we're looking for this, and uh, we'll contact our ecosystem partners in the community and ask if they have anybody they can recommend for this, and then we'll reach out to those startups bring them in and uh, have them do a fast pitch uh, to the executives that can make a decision on the spot. We want to give a yes quickly that's scoped so that we can actually demonstrate success or failure quickly um, or you know, quickly just give a no and move on to the next thing because uh, everybody's time is precious. The Foundry's tagline is where ideas are made. And on first hearing that might sound a bit hippy dippy, wear a flower in your hair, San Francisco sort of stuff, but in reality it's not because the AT&T foundries are permitted a degree of latitude and a freedom that few other R&D labs ever enjoy. And that is the freedom to fail. To fail and then to move quickly on to the next potential opportunity. Our relationship to AT&T is that we're part of AT&T and we are treated as uh, you know, another extension that is uh, really there to help extend and explore and uh, we have the freedom to fail where others don't. I think uh, much more of the company has a responsibility to provide highly reliable services and we want to feed into that but we have the, the freedom to go and try things that, that really you know they have other priorities that are appropriate. Currently there are four AT&T foundries, three in the US in Palo Alto, in Atlanta in Georgia, Plano in Texas and there's one other in Tel Aviv in Israel. All the foundries have a shared goal to deliver projects and impact to the business. We also have a shared process in the way that we work with our inception documents, 12-week cycles, um, small teams, and we all have the same freedom to fail and I think uh, same drive to innovate and do something new. So what are you going to show us, Michael? What's, what's the first one of these three? So the first one is uh, APIs. So as I mentioned, we're trying to be as open as possible about making it, inviting as many people in to innovate with us. So one of the first projects we did was actually exposing an API platform, and we have an alpha version of that as well to, uh, to let people come in early and start trying it out. So I'm showing you here is a, a messages API. So this is where uh, the ability to actually quickly come in, take a look at uh, the API, and actually interact with it where you can actually go and you know send a message so if you want to experience it we can just put in hello and I've authenticated as myself so it will send on behalf of me and I can go and as a developer quickly get in and, and test the API so then uh, the use of these APIs yep. uh, has and the openness and kind of like quick ability to, uh, to integrate them yep. has allowed us to use them in some interesting use cases. Now this is one you're talking about which is the disaster um, disaster recovery. recovery. Yeah. yeah, so after the Oklahoma tornado last year, uh, a couple of us got together and we're thinking we wanted to do something about this and we were thinking well maybe we could put together an app that would allow messaging so people could message I have a need, I have a want, maybe we could link it up. We we're just brainstorming ideas and uh, Someone suggested we look around and see if someone was already doing this, and lo and behold, someone was doing basically exactly what we wanted to do, but in the web only. And right. so this was a company, recovers.org, 
And uh, so we called them up. Actually, someone found them on LinkedIn. We called them. We're talking to them that afternoon, and that was a Friday. And then over the weekend, we worked with them. Their CTO was on a, I think we talked to him at the airport as he was flying to Oklahoma, actually. And uh, we started working with them. We integrated our APIs and added the ability to do text messaging. So then people could text in, because a lot of people didn't have their computers, and Recovers was only computer mm -hmm. oriented. But it was like perfect for the use case we had in mind. And uh, so we worked with them and integrated messaging. And then a couple days later, people were texting in needs, and it actually uh, got so quite a what were the needs? Use. Sort of clothing, food, water, what uh, was pitchfork, it? Pitchfork, uh, ah. bulldozers, shovels. Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, yeah. uh, digging things out, yeah. food, water. I, Another one is uh, Uverse. Uverse is our IPTV and internet offering in the home. Uh -huh. So this is an example of a startup that had an idea and they pitched to us in the uh, fast pitches that I mentioned earlier. So the company came in called Sunday Sky. This is in our Israel foundry. And they had a product that would take, uh, would create uh, video coupons. And uh, an executive at at t saw this and thought it would be really useful for, to enhance our video bills. So we could feed in this XML schema to their product and it would create a bill appropriate for each customer so that we could, you know, um, make it easier to understand the bill. So you actually send a video with the bill, basically? That's right. We actually, uh, there's a, a channel that the customer goes to and they see their bill. Uh, if we take an XML file of all the information, we feed it to the Sunday Sky technology and it creates a customized video for each customer that goes through in detail and explains their bill and if there was a proration because they started in the middle of the month, et cetera, and explains that all. And, Turned out it uh, reduced um, calls significantly. And also, I believe it was so popular that users themselves put it on YouTube to say, this is great, we, we like this. That's right. So the first video on YouTube was actually from a customer, not from AT&T. Also, Michael, there's been a lot of talk recently and a lot of reference to SON, self-optimizing networks. You've done some work in that regard as well. Well, yes, actually, uh, the Israel Foundry uh, found a company called Intucell. It was a 20-person company, and they had them do a fast pitch to our CTO, liked the idea, asked them to do a trial. They came to San Francisco, and they did a trial uh, during the Beta Breakers, which is an event that you know uh, is very congested, very crowded. Uh, they reduced drop calls by nearly 20% during the event, so a big success, and now it's actually rolled out nationwide and it caught the attention of Cisco, who ended up purchasing them recently for over $400 million. The other question I have to ask you is about SDN. There's been a huge emphasis on software-defined networks over the past 15, 18 months or so. Mm -hmm. Are you doing work there? Yeah, we're doing quite a bit of work there. Uh, and a lot, of, a lot of the area where we're prototyping some of that is in OpenStack. Yep. So we use OpenStack for a lot of our uh, development environment. And I can show you a little bit about what that looks like. Well, it's not a... It. We have here is just uh, this is just a standard OpenStack demonstration of what what it can look like when you have these SDN scenarios. Yeah. And uh, we have here is you'll see this is just a topology map showing uh, a public network, yeah. uh, an internal network, yeah. two two internal networks, and we have computers that are connected. Uh, one that's actually a router, yeah. uh, and one that's bridging the two networks. Yeah. And we can just uh, come in here and click through and uh, go to the VMs and add resources and. If we wanted to add a network, it's as easy as clicking a button and adding it. So this is just within the, op the OpenStack environment, but it's a, uh, an experience of what it can be like once the network becomes programmable and I, as a user, can go in and define it myself. And it's on its way. It's happening, isn't it? It is indeed. It's, uh, it's out there. So uh, we're going to leverage it and see what kind of uh, new services we can put on top. Nice to see it in reality rather than reading it in a book.